Welcome everyone. We are beyond excited as the weather picks up and it's getting nice and warm to hear from Lauren Lieberman this evening, which I know is a complete passion of hers as she shares that she has taught aquatics in uh, Perkins School for the Blind and just absolutely loves this. So I'm hoping this evening that you can take lots of tips, learn lots of things and enjoy learning from Lauren. Thank you so much, Melissa. And I just wanna thank everybody from APH for putting this together. This is one of my favorite topics. Again, when I taught at Perkins in the deaf blind program, I coached the swim team at Perkins and all my kids had multiple disabilities. And it's such a joy when there's aha moments and kids do things that their parents never thought they could do. And they come and they videotape you and they cry because they're so happy and excited. And so I love those moments. And uh, so there's a picture here with one of my students and one of our kids from our swim and gym program. Uh, Lauren, hold yes. on one second. We're gonna get let Alale uh, interpret and then we'll go for it. Okay. Hold on. Okay, go ahead, Lauren. And this picture on the right is we just had in the end of January, we had a Lavelle Fund for the Blind conference with families of kids with visual impairments and additional disabilities. I'll talk a little more about that, but that's from that conference. So I am a distinguished service professor at SUNY Brockport in adapted physical education. And I also co-direct the Institute on Movement Studies for Individuals with Visual Impairments. There's our website if you'd like to learn a little bit more about it. And in this presentation, I'm gonna talk about the benefit of aquatics. We're gonna talk about transfers, pre-teaching in the pool, positioning, foundational swim skills, game skills and group games, seizures, and I have lots of resources for you. So just a basic about transfers. I know a lot of you know about transfers. The top right is a Hoyer lift. Left part is the left ramp is called a zero entry ramp, but you can also have one person at the shoulders and one person at the person's feet. You can do a side by side transfer when one person's on the right and one person's on the left under the arm and leg. And then we can also do what's called a pivot transfer. And I even have some kids who prefer to get out of their chair or out of their walker on their own. And I think that's really great for independence if that's what they prefer. Some pool tips, and, and this, is, this is just from my experience and from some of my research. And this is one of our students at our swim and gym program here. Swim diapers should be worn in the pool. Don't wear regular diapers in the pool, that's a no-no. The best therapeutic temperature is between 84 and 92 degrees. Any, anything cooler is, is, is too cold. For the best instruction, we need one-to-one, -one, maybe even two-to-one for kids with multiple disabilities. But I also really believe that any assistants have to be trained and there's a starfish aquatics certification that they can get. There's two levels of certification if you're interested. And assessment is the key. L little increments of improvement, whether it's breath control, floating, kicking, little increments of improvement are what we see in our kids. It's not usually leaps and bounds, although sometimes that happens too. So just a bit about pre-teaching, especially if a child's visually impaired or blind, we have to have pathways from the locker room. Like we have one of those waterproof rugs that the kids can use their cane or follow with the good contrast against the floor. So sh show the pathway from the locker room to the pool. Consistent places to leave the towel with a tactile marking is so important. A lot of this is kind of known if, you, if you've been teaching in the field for a while. Learning the ladder and the lift and how to get in and out because kids are mortified if they're sitting there and everybody else is in the pool and the lift doesn't work. So making sure that that goes smoothly and that's part of pre-teaching. So you practice that. Also, kids need to learn all the flotation devices and what they're called and how they work so that they can ask for them and not have to wonder or go on the side and feel what's there. We have to teach them each one and what it's called and how it works. Again, also all the pool equipment, such as dumbbells or anything that you 
dive for like balls. We have a lot of duckies. The kids love the rubber duckies. Hula hoops, ping pong balls, toys, games, uh, pool noodles, all of that has to be explained to the kids. Whatever other kids can see has to be explained. And also make sure you share who's in the pool. That's really important as well, okay? Next is water orientation. Some of the kids might be really afraid of the pool. They might not understand how deep it is. Really showing them the perimeter of the pool, be patient and be persuasive. And if they can go in with a peer or a friend, that's really helpful. And always gently guide, don't force the child into the pool. Although I have been known to kind of pick up the kids and put them right in sometimes when, when I know the child can do it. You know. Explain everything in a calm, sympathetic, matter of fact voice. We don't want to get aggressive or frustrated. And that's why sometimes we do need to give them time. It takes a lot longer for kids to get used to it, to understand the perimeter, the di dimensions. If they can't feel where the floor is, they might get anxious. So it's time to get in the pool. We're ready to get in the pool. Now is time, is, are some of the quotes you can use. And then just progress step-by-step step gradually. If they don't wanna put their face in the water, they can just blow in your hand. They could put their chin in the water. They can just get their hair wet. That's okay. Make sure you create entry and exit routines with consistent cues and be consistent with the entry, entry and exit routines because they might get anxious if they're not similar. And again, be consistent in that. So, so positioning in aquatics is really, really important. And I'm gonna just go, this, this one will show you uh, some, the, the left-hand side here shows a child with pool noodles under his hips. Now you notice here, I am not impeding the child's arms. These wa duck water wings, that's okay just for playing around in the water. But if you wanna teach swimming, the arms and legs have to be free. So on the left here, you see a boy with pool noodles under his stomach. His arms are free, his legs are free. He's just ready to go, ready to reach, ready to blow bubbles, ready to, uh, to extend his arms on my shoulders if he needed to. On the bottom here is a boy on his back with flotation devices to keep his head up. He's smiling because he's comfortable. He can kick, he can jump up and down, he can move his arms above his head because his arms are free and he's floating. And in the top right here, again, is, it's a different position where the pool noodles are on the stomach and the child can kick. He can move his arms one at a time behind him. And again, you can do the same kind of thing with a kickboard if necessary. And so that, that's just kind of what this positioning slide is all about. But the, the other thing is they could rest their head or their chin on your shoulders. And they can put, again, that kickboard on their chest, laying on their back or laying on their front. I also encourage kids, especially kids with, that are just new to weight bearing to, to hold onto the wall and do some jumps. That's always helpful as well. See how long they can stand, see how many jumps they can do, see if they can slide up and down the wall independently. They could even do some jumps and skips and slides along the wall if possible. And again, they can do these with or without a life jacket. It's okay to try it without a life jacket and put it back on. I think it's good to know if that's a possibility. Sometimes kids are surprised how easy it is when they take off the life jacket. And if I'm going too fast, please ask a question if, if there's any questions that come up. So for breathing, we have kids blow bubbles in the water. We, I have kids feel me blow onto their hand and I say, now you do it. We do it with ping pong balls with bubbles, and then blow in their hand, and then practice blowing bubbles on top of the water, and eventually blowing bubbles in the water, and then going under the water. Some kids, it benefits them to have a straw in some cases for blowing bubbles. And there's a lot of different ways to teach bubbles. These are just a few of the techniques that we use. So for floating, they can, again, lay on mo multiple noodles and then take one away at a time. They can hold on to the wall, one hand, 
two hands, maybe no hands, just going against the wall, laying on a kickboard. And this picture is a child holding the kickboard on her, her stomach, on her chest, and then kicking with her feet. And the further they hold a kickboard, the more it works on their, their buoyancy. The closer they work, they hold the kickboard, the more it, it holds them up and the less they're working on their buoyancy. So you, you kind of decide that and slowly, slowly work towards that extension if it's possible. Time the kids. Kids love to beat their score. I did it for 10 seconds. I floated on my back for 10 seconds. I kicked five times all by myself. Count. Have them count. Empower them to know their own goals and dreams. And and sometimes when we do like a glide off the wall, I kind of guesstimate. You glided on the water under the until you were under the flags, so that when they're in the pool later, they know how to measure their performance. If they have some vision, let them use goggles to locate objects on the floor, like rings, colorful objects. Maybe you have some of those diving rings, anything like that is fun for kids to dive to under the water. So gliding on the water, under the water, and again, doing it with a flotation device is fine. We meet them where they are, and then we just go from there. So again, here's, here's kicking where our uh, Logan here is, is floating on his back. He's on his coach's chest, but she's also working with his arms backwards, swimming backwards and kicking. It's beautiful. He didn't even know he could do it. So he's got what's called a water belt on, which is, it's like a life jacket, but it's really just like, some people call it a water jogger because people run in those belts. So again, kicking or holding onto a wall with support or with a life jacket or not, holding onto a kickboard, kicking a beach ball across the pool. And if you need it to be auditory, you can put some bells in it. Uh, movement of a bicycle, like do bicycling. You can make waves with friends. The kids love making big waves. It's like, you're going to drown me. Make your waves bigger. Come on, tsunami. It's, that's a fun one to do. And, and really, you can also work on cardiovascular endurance as well. And again, they can hold on to their coach or their teacher on their front. You're holding the job on their front with their, with their head on your shoulder or on their back with their head on your shoulder or moving them out further and further from your body. Okay, so there's a lot of different ways to work on kicking. And again, kicking is a foundational swim skill and it's also great for fitness as well. So seizures in the pool, we have to make sure that we're prepared for seizures. We need to know if children have seizures, what they look like and what triggers them. We don't really wanna play games like holding your breath as long as you can if a child has seizures. They could hyperventilate before underwater swimming and that could cause a seizure. Also excessive drinking of pool water can lead to hyperhydration or hyponatremia, which also can promote seizures. So trying to avoid triggers is important first, of, first off. But then if they do have a seizure in the pool, we have to stay calm. We should alert somebody immediately, keep the child's face above the water. So I try to make sure I'm in the shallow end. If one of my students has a seizure, keep their head above water. Turn, their, turn my head away from them, put your arm around their chest, maintain an open airway, and prevent injury by providing support with a minimal amount of restraint. You don't wanna get hurt and you don't want them to get hurt. Get them on the deck, on a mat as soon as possible. And again, stand low in the water behind the individual's head so you're not gonna get banged in the head. Turn your face away from them, okay? And again, place them in a supine position. Again, supporting them under the armpits and around the, the chest. And then just keep their face out of the water. You don't have to hold them up, just their face out of the water. Keep their airway clear and remove them out of the water as soon as it's safe to do so. Stay calm. The, the pool's actually a good place to have a seizure, honestly. And so one of the big things I wanted to share tonight, since we did just have this Lavelle conference, I wanted to share some of our resources with you. We have what's called tip sheets. We have an entire tip sheet on transfer. So it explains the different transfer techniques. We have a swim 
skills tip sheet on basic swim skills, kind of like what I was just talking about. And then one tip sheet on flotation devices, because there are so many amazing flotation devices out there today. And this picture is just me working with one of the kids trying to get him uh, to blow some bubbles. And uh, he's thinking about it. He's thinking about it. And then I just wanted to share, this is a brand new video that we just made in at our conference. And if you go to campabilities.org and go to Lavelle Resources, these are the tip sheets, flotation device tip sheet, positioning and transfer tip sheet. And then this video is called Lavelle Fun for the Blind Aquatics Video. And so I just, I just queued it up to a part where that would be some interesting information. At the feet, legs, trunk, and or hands and arms. If needed, the use of ADA approved stairs, either built in or removable, should be provided. Again, it is best when a person is in front and behind the individual to provide support for safety. These accessible stairs are much easier than a built in the wall pool ladder for most individuals with multiple disabilities. If there is a zero. Provide support for safety. These accessible stairs are much easier than a built in the wall pool ladder for most individuals with multiple disabilities. If there is a zero depth or an in-water ramp or beach entry, we may provide support on either side or walk backwards with hands on the waist with the swimmer walking forward with hands on our shoulders. If a handrail is provided, this would be the entry of choice for many. If your swimmer is not able to bear weight and ambulate on stairs or a ramp, you can use a water wheelchair or shower chair and support the person by holding the chair handles or walking backwards, bracing the chair. A pool chair lift is used for those swimmers who need additional support to enter and exit the pool. There are several important safety aspects to consider, such as making sure Sure the chairlift does not move as the swimmer is transferring into it, making sure the lift is in the off position during transfers, making sure the swimmer's wheelchair is locked, and not opening seat and feet belts until a support person is behind the chair and in front of the swimmer. Just gives you a little, a little taste of this video and the pace of it and the examples. There's lots of really good examples. And then I'm gonna show you this flotation devices tip sheet. And the flotation devices tip sheet, like I said, it, this has a lot of the companies that, that have the flotation devices. They are not cheap though. I do wanna warn you, they're not inexpensive, these flotation devices. So this just gives you some different examples of different flotation devices and different things that you might wanna use for your students. And some of them around the neck, some of them around the whole body. And so, and it also gives you some ways where to get them with the, and the name of them and everything. Okay, so that's one of the tip sheets. And then heading back to our presentation, I just wanted to share this book called Assessments and Activities for Teaching Swimming. This is an ebook through Human Kinetics, which is a great resource. This is called Physical Education for Children with Moderate to Severe Disabilities. It has an entire chapter on aquatics. It's a great book for kids with visual impairments and deaf blindness. And so this is also through Human Kinetics, Physical Education for Children with Moderate to Severe Disabilities. This is a free download on our Camp Abilities website. It's called Gross Motor Development Curriculum. And it's under it's under instructional materials. This book's called Physical Education and Sports for People with Visual Impairments and Deaf Blindness, Foundations of Instruction. And that's also, that's through APH. And then inclusion in physical education and the use of paraeducators, because I talked about ensuring that you train paraeducators. There's a book called Paraeducators in Physical Education through human kinetics and there's lots of trainings on our campabilities website 
And then here's some other resources, APH.org, the physical education link, and then Perkins School for the Blind has some great books and videos. And USABA also has trainings for elite athletes. And this is my contact here, Lauren Lieberman. It's lieberman at brockport.edu. I would love to help you if you want to start a camp abilities. It's a sports camp for kids who are blind. If you want to host a swimming uh, weekend or conference with families and teachers, I love that kind of thing. And this is uh, one of our kids in our program who absolutely loves the pool. And it's just a joy to be part of that. So I hope that we can continue to open up the doors for or open up the doors of the pool for our kids with multiple disabilities because it's a great medium for them to learn every aspect of the expanded core curriculum. So I would like to open this up for some questions. Lauren, I was going to say I am like blown away by all of this. And I think what I absolutely love is just I mean, it sounds very simple. It sounds very easy to do. So there were a couple of questions. I'm looking back in the chat. Um, what is the Starfish Aquatic Certification? So it's an in-person and online aquatic certification. You pay for it, then you do part of it online. And then they have times when you meet. It's brand new. So they've had it only a few times. But if you email me, I can give you, um, Dr. Monica Lapore is giving those workshops around the country. Okay, and there was a question about, um, can you please list the first resource again? I'm not, I was trying to answer another question, so I didn't, I'm wondering. Sure, I think it was your, the yeah. assessment and activities for teaching swimming. That I think that was the first one. I think so, yes. And I did put the link into your Camp Abilities instructional. Um, yes, that one. Um, where we where would we find that one? This book is through Human Kinetics. It's an ebook. If you go into Human Kinetics, they have tons of adapted books, amazing resources. There's books on universal design for learning and physical education strategies for inclusion, para educators in physical education and assessment and activities for teaching swimming. Does the American Red Cross still offer adaptive swimming instructor classes? Not that I know of, but I, I, I'm not very familiar with that, that. Okay. I don't know that there's any other questions at the moment. We'll give it a second, but um, Lisa raised her hand. Yes. Lisa, can you put your question in the chat? How do you go about orientating blind kiddos in the pool? Oh, that's a great question. Pre-teaching, so we give them lots of time Walk them in, show them where the lockers are. Make sure you count the number of lockers in where they put their things. And then teach them about how to guide them. Like in ours, it's you go by the bench, then you go by two different openings for showers, make a right. Then we, we hug the bleachers. And then it's, the, it's like the third box that's open with equipment and that's where the ladder is. So like, you know, we count out where it is. And so... We do that practice, practice with the child, let them practice on their own if that's possible. And then they, we do that way before they're in the pool with other kids so that they feel comfortable with it. How do you get down the ladder if you're ambulatory? And then how deep is that? And then how, which side's the, the deep end, which is the shallow end? Where's the diving blocks? You know, so they understand where everything is, what it's called. Hey, can you take me to the diving block? I really wanna go there, I wanna jump off you know, so they can ask for what they want. Sometimes it takes two or three visits and that's okay because then they're in control. Pre-teaching is where it's at. Great. Another question is, are there different approaches for children who are deafblind? It just takes a little longer. And I also would want to make, you know, you have to make sure you know the sign for, you know, what if it's the diving block or if it's stop, start, the ladder, 
So making sure you know the signs for each cue that you're going to be giving. Great questions. Um, most local swim instructors around um, where this person is have no idea what to do with their daughter who is blind and tell me that they are not comfortable teaching her. It sounds like I can refer them to these links, but what would you say to them? Yeah, some parents are reluctant letting their children go swimming and they're so nervous because even if they have a trach, they can still go swimming. I think what you just need to do is take them somewhere where people know what to do. Watch some of these videos. I think a lot of these, so we have this video teaching kids with more multiple disabilities. We have another video on under instructional strategies that's just basic if you have a child with a visual impairment. Seeing other kids doing swimming skills that have the same disability as your child has, that can alleviate some of the fears, but also finding an adapted aquatics instructor that can teach the parents. One of my favorite things is having a workshop where I'm in the pool and you're teaching the parents the positioning, what your kids can do. We do the assessment. By the way, on our Camp Abilities website, we have an aquatics assessment. Under the home page. there's the assessment, and then you can click on that, and that gives you the aquatics assessment. I will put that in the chat. Um, the next question is, do kids leave their canes by the sides of the pool? Any safety concerns with that? I typically have them leave their cane with their towel and then figure out like, where's the towel in close proximity as close as it's safe to, to keep, leave it there. If the child is, feels more comfortable leaving the cane by the pool, getting out, using their cane to get to the towel, just making sure there's a tactile marking close enough to the cane so they know it's their cane and then so that they know where from where the cane is to get to their towel. And it's gonna be different for each pool, each child. Because the other thing, if you're in a public pool, you gotta make sure that people aren't gonna take the cane and put it somewhere else. Leave this here. Absolutely. Um, we have kids for four days at camp, not a lot of time to teach lessons. Would you still try to do an introduce lesson? Still try to introduce lessons? Always. I, I always to time to educate. Well, the other thing is they can have free time at the end, but and they can play in the pool all summer, but when are they gonna have instruction with people that know what to do? I use every moment we can to educate the kids because I just want the kids to know that we believe in them. We believe that they can achieve. They don't just have to participate. Too many people have really low expectations for them and we need to change that. One of our mottos for camp is believe you can achieve. We have to do that. Absolutely. And then there was just um, a consideration um, from experiencing triple checking that medical items such as glasses, hearing aids, cochlear implants, and insulin pumps are removed before water safety, um, before swimming. Definitely. Actually, cochlear implants, you can leave them in because there are these little Ziploc bags that go over them if they choose to wear them in the pool. I cannot remember the name of it, but it's like a, a little Ziploc bag that goes over, over your cochlear implant and you can leave it in okay. and you can use it over and over again. Awesome. Um, and then someone also mentioned that some insulin pumps are waterproof. Mm -hmm. Some aren't, some are. You got to make sure you know before they go swimming. Absolutely. Lauren, this has been an absolute pleasure, and I cannot tell you how many great resources and so many tips and tricks that you provided and shared. And again, for those of you who need to contact Lauren, um, her email, Lauren Lieberman or L Lieberman at Brockport.edu. And thank you so much, Lauren, for this wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I know it's a busy time of year, so. I appreciate you caring about your kids and about their success and achievement. Thank you.